Well, a very, very warm welcome, everyone, to the latest Social Contracts Research Seminar. Uh, our guest today is going to address us for around 40 to 50 minutes, uh, after, they'll be, after which there'll be time for Q&A. Uh, if you've got a question, do please write it in the chat, uh, and then I'll call upon people in the order that the questions are asked, uh, and then you can put your video on and ask your question directly to David uh, in the uh, question time. And it is really a very distinct pleasure uh, to be able to introduce our guest for this seminar. Uh, David Lyon is Principal Investigator of the Big Data Surveillance Project. Uh, he's former Director of the Surveillance Studies Centre uh, and is Queen's Research Chair in Surveillance Studies, Professor Emeritus of Sociology and Law uh, at Queen's University in Canada. Uh, his many books include Surveillance Society, 2001, Surveillance After September the 11th, 2003, uh, liquid Surveillance with Zingmans Bauman in 2013, and Surveillance After Snowden 2015. He's currently working on Surveillance, a very short introduction in that popular Oxford University Press series. Um, and his book Pandemic Surveillance with Polity Press uh, is set to be released very soon. So in short, I can think of no one in the world better qualified to address us on today's theme, which is surveillance capitalism meets the pandemic, surveillance challenges to the social contract. So please join me in welcoming our speaker today, David Lyon. Well, thank you very much for your welcome, Chris. It's good to be here and um, yeah, I'm no stranger to Melbourne or to Monash for that matter. I was a visiting professor at Monash in, I think, uh, 1999 to 2000. And um, what I can't believe about this event is that uh, it is taking place at eight o'clock in the morning. Now, that is something that I just don't think would fly in uh, our part of the world and certainly at our university. Um, so the fact that you are up and about and alert at eight o'clock in the morning strikes me as being, um, well, putting me in a, a position of great privilege, really. So uh, thank you for your welcome. I am happy to be here. Um, I have enjoyed many long blacks on Ligon Street and uh, I, of course, wish that I was actually there with you. However, um, there it is. Um, the other curious thing about today is that it's actually Thanksgiving in Canada today. When I first received the invitation, I saw it was going to be at eight o'clock, but the date was um, for October the 12th. And I'm afraid it didn't occur to me for a very long time that um, this was actually going to mean that I was going to be speaking on the evening of uh, our Thanksgiving. Mercifully, we had our family Thanksgiving uh, on Saturday, and uh, maybe to compensate for this, although it wasn't uh, arranged that way, I'm going to go uh, on a tandem bicycling ride with my wife tomorrow for four days, exploring some trails in what for us is uh, fall sunshine and fall colors. Anyway, to the point, let me uh, start talking about this topic. I was just saying to Chris that it is uh, a new angle for me. I haven't really uh, thought through the um, social contract dimensions before. So uh, I'm looking forward to your comments and questions. Um, so I, I'm going to say something about uh, the most recent aspect of pandemic surveillance, as I'm calling it, which uh, is vaccine passports, which are currently being introduced around the world. And they are, of course, just but one example of many of pandemic surveillance. But they, they do exemplify the issues. And they show, too, how uh, the issues cannot be framed only in terms of privacy, for example, or even just data protection. Um, I want to suggest that they are, with vaccine passports, as with other aspects of pandemic surveillance, to do with uh, data injustice issues. 
Now, earlier uh, forms of surveillance in the 19th and 20th centuries um, were based on a growing focus and dependence upon uh, bureaucratic information. And each one, each, each stage of that development of surveillance was met by uh, new uh, expressions of social contract, updates of what was thought of as the social contract. Um, and I want to suggest this afternoon, sorry, this morning, that uh, today's requires revamping due to the significance of data and the rise of surveillance capitalism. But what will it take, given the vast new surveillance powers that have been unleashed since social media, and especially since surveillance capitalism emerged? Where may hope lie, I'm going to ask towards the end of my talk, um, and perhaps, and plausibly, I think, in the civil society dimension of social contract, because of what I'll discuss as a looping effect. But that will only be the case if government and the corporate sector also uh, take a very strong and principled role. It's going to take a huge amount of effort to actually achieve something uh, that would come close to a new social contract equal to the issues raised today. Perhaps uh, some will be getting their nerve back within government as uh, the Americans start to confront Facebook in a more serious way. Anyway, let me start by saying something about uh, vaccine passports as surveillance. Quebec, the first Canadian province to approve vaccine passports, was immediately roiled with controversy at their introduction uh, during uh, at the end of last month, beginning of this month. Bar owners complain that instead of greeting patrons, they have to interrogate them. Uh, an issue erupted in the uh, Assemblée Nationale over whether les députés had to show their passports. Were they essential workers or not? And meanwhile, the uh, Ligue des Trois et Libertés worries about data security and the possibility that uh, the passport could be used for other monitoring purposes. And I understand that Australia rather like Canada, has a process of local decision-making about vaccine passports. Apart from the federal rules uh, about proof of vaccination at international airports, each jurisdiction is making its own rules about proof of vaccination. Andrew Barr, Chief Minister of the uh, um, ACT says that the territory will not issue vaccine passports. Why? For human rights and practical enforcement reasons. Why, he says, should, uh, why he asks, should vaccinated people be privileged with extra freedoms or others who, for whatever reason they are unvaccinated, be denied services or access? Not for the first time during the pandemic then, the specter of surveillance has surfaced, this time with vaccine passports. Pressure to roll them out came from travel and hospitality companies, especially anxious for a return to business as usual. And newscasts boast constantly of their success in reducing COVID-19 infection rates, which in Canada anyway, which makes me think that perhaps that's the subtext in any case for uh, introducing such passports to try to raise the vaccination rates. But amid the various arguments about vaccine passports, a further conversation is largely absent about the surging surveillance enabled by yet another pandemic innovation. And of course, the pull of back to normal is under, understandably strong. After nearly two years of tragic death rates in some places, 
anxieties over personal and family health, and constant lockdowns and other restrictions. Chris was just telling me about the lockdown in, in Melbourne and the effects on his family. And so, you know, I'm, I'm very aware of this. Um, and of course, as with many other people, I have people who've been, I have friends and relatives who have been directly affected by the pandemic and nothing that I should say, uh, that I will say should uh, diminish that sense of my own involvement in this as with others. In fact, I, I dedicated the pandemic surveillance book to three people who died of COVID, uh, my brother-in-law, a close friend, and a former colleague. So that pull of back to normal is significant, but the call for a just recovery is also very urgent, especially in view of the massive uptick in monitoring and surveillance that puts those, for example, following 9-11 in the shade. Such a just recovery demands that the uneven impacts of the pandemic, especially along the lines of class, race, and gender, be addressed in concrete ways that are manifestly fair. So what, you might ask, is the connection between surveillance and injustice? Isn't privacy the core issue? Well, privacy is challenged in new ways, it's true, perhaps above all in the domestic context, uh, targeted in unprecedented ways during the pandemic's oft-repeated oft stay home, stay safe mantra. But the privacy questions are far from identical for all. Think about it. If you are working remotely, for example, there's a vast difference between the experience of the comfortable white collar professional working remotely and precarious gig workers. Also, the stay home rule has everywhere increased the burden on women, often including their unwelcome exposure on screen to unknown others while working, shopping, or learning online. The fact is that, as in other areas, pandemic surveillance is both experienced more profoundly among those already disadvantaged, and it often serves to retrench rather than rectify such disadvantages. This is certainly true for indigenous people in North America and I imagine in uh, Australia as well, who suffer from both insufficient surveillance, their condition lacks adequate data for a whole range of reasons, and slanted surveillance, uh, that is mistaken assumptions made by health authorities that then get written into algorithms about their pandemic knowledge and practices. And of course, those vaccine passports themselves are indelibly surveillant. They rely on government held personal health data that citizens are obliged to display for travel or for social participation. They make their holders visible to airlines, to restaurants, to sporting events, um, and the like, representing them as responsible citizens and permitting movement or access to those holders. Now, as it happens, there are many valid reasons why you might not hold a vaccine passport. You may be immunochallenged, for instance, or fear that the warning labels on Pfizer and Moderna uh, about the possibilities of heart inflammation may affect you as a senior with a history of cardiac problems. You may have read the small print on the vaccine limits or the side effects and decided that you have uh, to wait for improved options. But those choices, of course, carry consequences. When it comes to vaccine passports, you may well be refused boarding at an airport uh, or being served at a bar. And worse, you may be scapegoated. You fill a new role as an excludable, risky other. <laughs> 
Now, controversy over vaccine passports due to their potential divisiveness was predicted early on by the, wealth, uh, the World Health Organization, uh, who uh, did not express a direct view on their uh, desirability, but offered plenty of arguments against them. Um, in the UK, the report from the Ada Lovelace Institute uh, warns profoundly about the problems associated with vaccine passports. And the Office of the Privacy Commissioner in, in our country, in Canada, has uh, done the same kind of thing. Also in Canada, the Waterloo-based uh, CG, Centre for International Government Innovation, innovation um, observes that the expansion of digital IDs in the guise of such passports will likely entail a control creep outcome. Also back in the UK, uh, someone like health researcher Robert Dingwall decries the arrival of what he calls the biosecurity state in vaccine passports. And one repeated concern uh, regarding these is how and when they might be phased out again. Or will they remain long after the pandemic is over? Okay, so there are some thoughts on the uh, vaccine passports as uh, an interesting and I think important dimension of pandemic surveillance. Let me try to sketch a bit of a, a wider picture now that uh, perhaps will put the vaccine passports in context. Of course, it's the case that many kinds of surveillance that were introduced for the pandemic could also be here to stay. They, I believe, as with all the others, should be questioned as the post-pandemic future starts, most of us hope, to emerge. After all, red lights began to flash almost as soon as COVID-19 was identified when a raft of new surveillance techniques from digital contact tracing onward were hastily rolled out, courtesy of over-eager over tech companies and underprepared public health authorities. Which is true of many countries around the world. Uh, it's true that maybe South Korea, China, Taiwan, um, Hong Kong, and one or two other countries, because of their experience with SARS, were a bit more prepared, but really there was widespread uh, under-preparation, uh, as well as, as I say, uh, plenty of over-eager tech companies. And before we knew it, big data solutions were front and center, offering the modeling behind the now familiar dashboards of pandemic progress that appear daily on our computer and television screens, and the means to remotely track and trace potentially infected people. Now, of course, there is value in these initiatives, and I'm not decrying them uh, as such. Some have been credited with saving lives, and of course the uh, data will only be coming in on the reality of those initial um, calculations of uh, saved lives as a result of the uh, introduction, the, these initiatives. Uh, and of course they have been uh, credited as well with uh, preventing uh, ICUs, intensive care units, from being overwhelmed. But who knew what actually happened in order to make those kinds of things happen? I can tell you that in Ontario, very few people are aware that our Personal Health Information Act was actually altered in order to allow these changes to take place back in April 2020. In moreover, it was altered within uh, what we call an omnibus bill, in other words, a bill that covered all kinds of other issues as well as this one, uh, and it was to facilitate increased data access um, during the pandemic. Um, who knew, too, that most Canadians, in the end, never used the 
uh, COVID alert app, which was our version of the uh, Apple Google API enabled uh, app for remote contact tracing. Uh, and those Canadians who refused them um, did so because of um, privacy concerns on the one hand, as most of them would put it, and uh, on the other, accessibility and inclusion challenges, which affected vulnerable people such as seniors. So as I say, who knew what processes were uh, undergone in order to create the possibility for these big data so-called solutions uh, during the early days of the pandemic. But of course, pandemic is not simply uh, a um, public health event. Um, and, and the very fact that it is a public health event alone reminds, reminds us that it is always more. Um, you are probably aware of the uh, famous text by Michel Foucault on um, that is translated as Discipline and Punish, which is the location within which many find the panopticon as being kind of the most fascinating exemplar. And I'm wondering how many people had actually read the earlier part of the chapter on panopticism, which uh, is actually about the plague. And so Foucault is writing about 17th century plague and uh, the introduction to that chapter about panopticism really occurs not with the di diagram for a uh, prison plan with an all seeing capacity for the so-called inspector and uh, full visibility for all inmates within the prison or jail or penitentiary. It was the plague and it was the plague town. And here was the interesting thing in Foucault's description. It had to do with the ways in which the uh, tentacles of surveillance very quickly reached throughout the town. And uh, his description is fascinating for the ways in which you see uh, surveillance being monitored by uh, guards and by militia and so on and so forth. Those uh, warlike aspects of pandemic, the battle, the war against the uh, contagion, all those things are very old motifs and certainly not uh, limited to the pandemic uh, that we are still suffering. So uh, that notion in Foucault that the, the pandemic town, the plague town is the site of surveillance is a fascinating and important insight. Um, the pandemic that we are in prompted massive surveillance expansion in many other areas of social life besides those directly related to medicine and health especially via the stay at home, stay safe mantra. And of course, that is clear in the Foucault uh, analysis as well, that uh, the plague town is the place where homes are particularly targeted. And that's where you needed those militia, those guards, the other symbols of public order. But in our pandemic, those kinds of uh, figures who appear in Foucault's plague, plague Town are actually primarily online. Of course, you may meet the police officer, you may meet the uh, security person at the, uh, at the airport, but by and large, the militia, the guards, the other agents of public order are frequently actually online. So through working remotely, now made possible by digital means, by learning remotely equally, shopping online, being entertained at home, all these entail an explosion of domestic surveillance 
through platforms such as ProtoScore for monitoring employee performance. I'll just mention one for each area, Zoom for myriad online conferencing purposes, Examity for remote uh, proctoring or invigilation of text, tests and examinations, Amazon, of course, for universal shopping, plus music and movie providers to compensate for the erosion of public entertainment, and so on and so forth, and, and for public life in general. Every last one of the myriad platforms that repurposed itself for the pandemic is highly surveillant. So when I speak of pandemic surveillance, I'm not only referring to remote digital um, contact tracing uh, or to the large scale um, data modeling that done by uh, statisticians and uh, software scientists, but I'm also talking about all those forms of, uh, of uh, surveillance that were expanded hugely uh, to the great profit, of course, of the corporations involved during the pandemic. So that brings me to my next um, area, surveillance capitalism meets the pandemic, and that's in the uh, title of uh, the talk today. In each case, whether to do with medicine and public health or stay home initiatives, surveillance capitalism is also implicated, primarily through public-private partnerships between government departments and platform companies. Indeed, some speak of a, uh, an epidemiological turn in digital surveillance. Uh, with two dimensions, at least. On the one hand, function creep, I already mentioned that, and on the other, market making, thus Lynette Taylor. Um, on the one hand, already existing systems have been upgraded or repurposed for the COVID situation, sometimes ones developed by mobile network operators for low to medium income countries over recent decades, those, those are the ones of particular interest to uh, Lynette, Mark, uh, Lynette Taylor and her colleagues at uh, Tilburg University in the Netherlands, uh, working on the ways in which uh, pandemic and pandemic surveillance was very much, or is very much, a global phenomenon and one that affects global south in different ways from global north countries. So, uh, on the other hand, then the um, market making market making software developers such as Google have launched mobile apps to support contact tracing, and such developers believe that they can themselves benefit from the use of the apps. And uh, this is hardly surprising. Google itself has been seeking greater means of access to health data for years, which is where surveillance capitalism becomes evident. And in the in the book, I, I detail those dimensions of things uh, a little bit more fully. Surveillance capitalism, whose emergence was first noted by people such as Vincent Mosco or John Foster and Robert McChesney, uh, McChesney in uh, 2013, 2014, is now associated above all with the name of Shoshana Zuboff and her 2019 blockbuster, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. In it, she describes how value is extracted from data created as a byproduct of everyday use of digital technologies, primarily, of course, the smartphone. Her analysis of Google's role in this process, in particular, is very telling. Although she is often criticized for ignoring other analysts' work in the area, and also for regarding surveillance capitalism as an aberration, a subspecies of capitalism. And of course, uh, the debate over surveillance capitalism uh, has only just begun. Zuboff's argument is that surveillance capitalism bears a strong resemblance to B.F. Skinner's Walden II, a behaviorist dystopia, or utopia, if you like, where technology drives decision-making and compensates for the deficiencies of uh, human decision-making, or I should say the alleged 
deficiencies of human decision making, particularly the moments of uh, free will and autonomy. The system uses data to predict outcomes and to produce addiction among users that together offer unprecedented opportunities for platform companies to manipulate and exploit the inner lives and from there the uh, outer life practices of their users. As Kirsty Ball points out in her review of the age of surveillance capitalism, Zuboff also helpfully makes much use of the language of securitization, often referring to the states of exception and rendition visible in the activities of surveillance capitalism today. And of course, you have heard those uh, concepts used in relation to earlier uh, forms of um, surveillance and securitization activity, particularly following 9-11. The suspension of democratic rules, normal democratic practice uh, is the state of exception, and the use of coercion, the rendition, uh, these have been debated by Giorgio Agamben, for example, and many others, as I say, especially since 9-11. Curiously, these military security metaphors for the war against COVID-19 have also become prominent during the pandemic, aided and abetted by the same surveillance capitalist platforms. So I see that uh, we're moving forward in time. I'm going to move on to make some comments uh, in the last part of my talk regarding uh, social contract and the possibilities for a reset of social contract. The abstract for this little talk said that said this: a singular conjunction of data-dependent solutions to problems posed by the COVID-19 pandemic gave surveillance capitalism, along with willing governments, fresh opportunities to introduce innovations that reduce freedom and fairness in the name of extraordinary emergency measures. This, to my mind, highlights the need for a contemporary reset of any notion of a social contract, as government and business partnerships on the one hand and digitally disempowered citizens and cons consumers, on the other, struggle to recognize each other, let alone develop, to develop a meaningful modus vivendi for a global and a planetary future. Well, it was pretty bold stuff that I wrote for the um, abstract, and um, I, I confess that I, I don't think I have uh, managed to do all that. But anyway, let me just make some comments about the social contract part of it. This notion, as you're aware, derived originally from early modern thinkers, uh, Hobbes, Locke, and Rousseau especially, and has been adapted with uh, ongoing social, political, and economic change, not to mention cultural change, for the past 300 years. And in particular, the security, protection, and welfare gradually offered by governments in return for the loss of so sovereignty among citizens has increasingly re revolved around issues of information and laterally data. In everything from conscription-related data for the call up of soldiers for war, to the data amassed for the purpose of welfare provision, the social contract has been under question and gradually, sometimes painfully, revised. People like uh, Edward Higgs in his very helpful history of the information state uh, shows us this. Then historians such as James Benninger in his 1986 book observe that bureaucratic monitoring arose in relation to industrialization, using new technologies, typewriters, telephones, cameras, 
uh, and so on. The Telegraph, there were so many of them. And uh, Joshua Lauer has in recent years suggested a number of other uh, innovations that from very early on had uh, surveillance uses, not only within government, but also within the world of commerce uh, from the early 20th century on. But anyway, the, the Benninger argument is that those new technologies were to govern citizens as the kind of things that might be uh, governed otherwise in emerging industrial processes. So this kind of metaphor of governing uh, people as things are governed that is going on in, in Benninger's book. This process intensified during the 20th century as both warfare and welfare, not to mention the later 20th century growth of targeted advertising, required increasing amounts of personal data that were processed in increasingly arcane ways. So uh, what I'm saying there is that the transparency of populations of, of all kinds increased simultaneously with the decreasing transparency of those who were doing the surveilling. Thus, Tony Weller suggests that today's variant of the classic social contract in democratic states is, as she says, that, quote, citizens accept surveillance in order to ensure that they are entitled to welfare and protected from threat, as long as the means of surveillance are transparent and accountable, end quote. Now, controversies about this new variant have become more and more strident in the 21st century, in North America, especially after 9-11, and then increasingly worldwide with the rise of social media, seen sharply in the uh, Cambridge Analytica Facebook debacle, and uh, the Snowden revelations, of course, preceding that of 2013, and now today in the COVID-19 pandemic starting early in 2020. All too frequently, so far from actively consenting to surveillance, citizens and cons consumers are unaware that they are under surveillance, or at least unaware that they are under the kinds of surveillance that they are uh, that, that they are under. And at the same time, questions of transparency can easily be used to deflect attention from the deeper issues of accountability itself. And interestingly, with the rise of China as a leading player in the digital world, the questions find a new foil in the growth of authoritarian capitalism and its associated surveillance much criticized, of course, in the Western world. But this also deflects attention from what is actually happening in supposedly social democratic polities, where surveillance power grows, especially through these public-private partnerships, seen in bold relief during the pandemic. However one looks at it, the pandemic has to be seen as an opportunity for the largest global surveillance surge ever to appear. So what role might the popular myth of the social contract play post-pandemic? And by the way, I'm using the word myth there, not as something that uh, doesn't exist so much as in its cultural sense of being an important dimension of our uh, social imaginaries. Uh, the term is Charles Taylor's and uh, one that I've used in my view uh, that I found very useful over the past number of years. How can the notion of a fair deal between state and citizen be restored or perhaps reframed or rediscovered or reset, to use a digital term, after the pandemic? Let's not forget that the role of surveillance capitalism has been prominent during the pandemic, often seen in the key developments, as I've mentioned, such as the Apple Google API for constant, uh, contact tracing apps, or in the donation of billions by Bill Gates to speed vaccine development, 
while at the same time, he remained a top donor to the World Health Organization, which does leave one wondering about his influence on global health policy, especially as in many places, he seems to be treated as a kind of uh, national statesman. There are many structural barriers to enhancing digital citizenship in a datafied society. One key issue is the way that relations of power translate into influence uh, over public debates about data collection, analysis, and use. People may be alerted to the realities of rapidly rising surveillance, but counter, uh, counter narratives about security and now public health quickly and strategically arise to tamp down negative critique. Dreams of digitally enhanced citizenship patterns are punctured by the realities of surveillance capitalism, in which the amassing, analyzing, and use of data by corporations and governments lead to more authoritarian practices. Data ownership and its associated concentrations of wealth and power in a small number of techn technology monopolies and other platform companies is a key issue militating against the growth of digi digital citizenship of more meaningful kinds. Yet there are also groups arguing more strenuously for participatory practices in the design and use of digital infrastructure and finding ways to develop a digital commons where shared responsibilities are paramount. I've argued for some time that ways forward for digital citizenship have to be based on the ways that ordinary internet users may show themselves to be more than the things that James Benninger argued was how they began to be treated in the 20th century. For as Ian Hacking argues, there is what he calls a looping effect in which those under surveillance become aware of the surveillance and its effects even if only in the mild way, in a mild way, as they feel spooked by the speed with which advertising appears in their feed after they have written a message or ordered some merchandise online. But that looping shows critically how those affected may be treated like things, but may not be reduced to things. In that looping process, we see a crack that lets in the light, light, that may emerge as democratic opportunity. Simultaneously, other features are required on the landscape of any renewed social contract. For one thing, we need to be clear about what sorts of issues have to be confronted. One key area relates to the ways in which issues of surveillance have been questioned over past decades, indeed since the late 19th century, under the rubric of privacy. Now, Privacy does have unavoidably social dimensions, and I don't want to underplay those. But the ways in which everyday internet users appeal to the concept shows that many think only of the individual aspects of privacy seen as a kind of personal matter. We will have to live with privacy laws and their related international organizations for, for a while. But to address the issues raised here, more is needed. Data justice is a concept that resonates with me and with others with the concerns about inequality and injustice perpetrated by contemporary surveillance. Today's surveillance practices are inextricably tied up with modes of scoring and ramp ranking consumers, citizens, and indeed all exposed to today's black platforms. This is the world that is exposed very helpfully to the reality of data injustice through series such as uh, Black Mirror. But data justice reminds us that surveillance uses data to make ordinary people visible to those in power, whether government, corporation, or a combination of the two. But it also represents them according to its criteria and then treats them according to those representations. Vaccine passports, where we began, makes visible those with and without vaccination, re representing them as irresponsible or careless or worse if they don't have one, uh, and allowing them to be treated negatively by exclusion from privileges or needed services. But even if one is equipped with a strong notion of data justice, there still must be engagement in order to act 
as a digital citizen. Robert Palito, in a recent book, starts a discussion of this, in which he, uh, where he discusses what he calls bargaining with the machine, technology surveillance and the social contract. He observes tellingly that consumer desire reproduces consent to a consumer society. He points out that instead of simply inviting surveillance by our everyday online interactions, we should rather find ways to express social values, to be aware of so-called externalities, and to see protecting personal dignity as an obligation. He maintains, and I agree, that we should take uh, all take our in online interactions more seriously. But this kind of work requires fuller analysis and debate, and also work that is more fully attuned to the already existing questions about surveillance and social contract. At the end of the day, the question remains, how far does a social contract really exist in relation to contemporary surveillance in a world increasingly dominated by the powerful platforms of surveillance capitalism? That the idea could, and I venture to say should, be explored is an important one and a timely one. And as I say, I uh, salute the organizers of this seminar for raising it as a question for me to consider. But it'll take much careful research to draw out the key issues, which here I have, have argued should be couched as social justice, uh, sorry, data justice, and not just privacy or even data protection. And perhaps above all, it will evel, involve what uh, Paolo uh, Freire called conscientization of internet users, that is all of us, to be aware of more issues than just our own dignity or internet freedom. It will require new content in terms such as state, where the state, when corporate power is so deeply inscribed in government activity, and the other concept, civil society, when so frequently the latter is seen merely in terms of voluntary associations and not as vital players in determining the terms of a social contract. But now would be a crucial moment for such debates to occur. When the pandemic has unleashed the largest surveillance surge ever, and few hesitated to ask, whether the results of this tech solutionist surge were either fit for purpose or supportive of data justice. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you so much, David. Um, there's a, a huge amount for us to be thinking about, very serious and immediate issues that you've been raising. Um, I know that I have about 20 questions I'm keen to ask, but I, I see that um, Philip, uh, has put a question here uh, in the chat. So Philip, could I invite you to turn on your video and ask your question directly, please? Yeah, of course. Um, hi, David, thank you very much uh, for that. Um, fascinating um, talk. I was wondering as you were speaking towards the end there, um, how, whether or not you, you're, you'd be willing to sort of comment on, on the, um, on the relationship between these sort of logics of surveillance and control that you've been describing and the rise or the apparent rise in conspiracy theory, um, disruptive discourses, sort of post-truthism um, that's happened in these, these same spaces because the, the, the two logics seem um, contradictory. Um, and I, I, I wonder if you, if you have thoughts on, on how they might relate to each other. Always difficult to uh, answer questions about things I haven't said rather than things that I have said. Yeah, sorry. Um, <laughs> but uh, I do think it's important. Let me just point you in the direction of uh, work that I, I think relates to this. There are a number of uh, really good articles uh, on this kind of theme in uh, uh, journals such as, uh, uh, I was going to say, uh, oh dear, slipped my mind now. Um, what's the one about television and social media? I've noticed a number of good articles there. But anyway, there's a book by um, uh, Arna Hiltz and <clears throat> others. Um, 
that is the group from Cardiff University in uh, in in England that uh, has a data justice lab, and I find their work very helpful and persuasive. And they have people involved both in journalism and uh, popular uh, communication on the one hand, uh, and to do with the social anal analytics of uh, surveillance capitalism and uh, data injustice. So sources like that are the ones that I would go to to find an adequate answer to the question. But as I say, uh, for this talk, I hadn't really um, thought through the connections there, but but you're absolutely right. They are They are there and should be made. Thank you. David, I wonder if I could try and put, for, for the sake of being a devil's advocate, a, a, a counter argument to the point you were making early on about vaccine passports. Hmm. Um, because what, what you will sometimes hear is that, that the argument for vaccine passports in, in social contact, contract terms is a, is a common good argument yep. in the sense that without measures like that, some people in society who are uh, immunocompromised or who are unable to get vaccinated for medical reasons are effectively going to be prisoners in their own homes unless they can be sure that the people they're interacting with have had the vaccine. So the, the sense there is that I, as someone who, um, who is vaccinated, pay the price in terms of surveillance, but I do that for the sake of others who, if I didn't pay that, the argument goes relatively small price, would pay the huge price of not being able to leave their homes at all. And then the argument would, would be framed in terms of balance, the metaphor of balance. Mm -hmm. uh, we balance, you know, my right not to be surveilled with, with other people's right to be able to leave their home. And I, I guess my question there is, do you think this metaphor of balance is helpful? And what do you make of that common good argument for vaccine passports? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, for a start, I truly believe that we should be seeking the common good. I regard the common good as uh, as uh, as the basis of some very strong arguments in this area. However, I also think that the um, the arguments are are questionable and I, I already mentioned one aspect of their questionability as it were in uh, in what I said that the um, the arguments for the common good seem to be undermined by the notion that you can, um, uh, that the vaccine passport will bring down the, uh, sorry, will, will rise the, raise the number of people who are actually getting vaccinated. And there's actually an empirical basis for that in Canada. Uh, since the introduction of the passports, more people are getting vaccinated, which suggests that it's not immuno uh, compromised folks. It's not. It's it's something else. And so there's an, an incentive there uh, that you can't get the service that you want um, to get the passport. And so the common good argument, I think, is 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 a really important one. And I think that we should we should engage the, the argument around those kinds of uh, bases. Well, around that kind of basis, the, the common good. Um, so, yeah, I, and, and the, the debate is really at a very early stage at the moment. That's another thing that, that I would say. Um, and as I say, I, I haven't, I hadn't really started thinking seriously about the, the social contract arguments about this thing until you invited me for this event. Uh, I've thought much more in terms of the, the data justice questions, as opposed to thinking merely about privacy or even about data protection. Uh, and those seem to me to be germane to the wider question about um, uh, common good and the arguments for vaccination. But yeah, I, I'm I'm open to all kinds of counter arguments because I'm just trying to think these things through for myself as well. Yeah. Thank you. I see from the chat that Stephanie has a question. Could I invite you to ask your question, Stephanie? Thank you. Hi, thank you so much for the talk. Um, uh, my question actually relates to the last two uh, sort of questions that's been asked. Um, it's about the common good argument uh, question. And uh, to me, it seems like the introduction of vaccine passports 
seemingly relate to a sort of Hobbesian authoritarianism, um, wherein Hobbes states that the state ought to control almost every aspect of citizens' life and that the state power ought to be absolute. And so the introduction of vaccine passports and the ID and the state actions such as stay-at-home orders and um, the boundaries of surveillance and information privacy being pushed seemingly reminds me of sort of a Hobbesian authoritarianism. And Hobbes invokes this authoritarianism because he questions whether agent self-interest would override the their motives to contribute to the common good. Um, so I was wondering if you believe that the introduction of vaccine passports and things of this nature speak to a modern state conception um, about the social contract relating to agents' willingness to contribute to the, the common good voluntarily, um, or if it speaks to sort of assumptions about self-interest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. Um, so yeah, part, part of the difficulty is that um, com, uh, social contract arguments are, 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 are not frequently visible as part of the currency of these conversations anyway. And so we're kind of imputing to participants in the debate the notion that there is such a thing as a social contract and that it has certain uh, characteristics and attributes and, and so on. So it's a bit of a... Um, uh, it's a bit of a moot point. We're discussing something that that uh, lacks concrete reality, but at the same time, uh, as I just said to Chris, I think that it is a, a really important question. I think the the notion that uh, governments have become increasingly authoritarian is certainly part of the equation that we should be considering here, and also the reasons why they would uh, drift to authoritarian kinds of um, activity and policy at this time. Because while you can see the importance of uh, a strong government approach to attempting for the common good to limit the spread of COVID-19, um, you can you can see how that is is justifiable, and you know I I think that the ways in which this was handled in in countries like uh, New Zealand and uh, Taiwan, for two examples, and for different reasons, were if not exemplary, certainly ones that showed a high degree of concern for the common good among those who were government leaders, uh, and of course in the Taiwanese case, uh, there were there was a lot of work done by um, people uh, people who were software analysts and and indeed um, who were uh, uh, hackers in in order to support what the government was doing. So there's an extraordinary confluence of interest between civil society, as it were, and government in Taiwan. Uh, in New Zealand, um, I put it down largely to uh, an administration and a prime minister that was singularly uh, uh, well devoted to the notion of a, a, a common good of uh, the people for whom she felt she had responsibility. So, you know, there are examples of strong actions being taken for the common good, but in, in other countries and, and uh, you know, including Canada, frankly, I find a kind of authoritarianism about um, some of these actions, but at the same time, an unwillingness to take that kind of authoritarian uh, stance right through to its logical conclusion, which would be to say, this is a national policy, a federal policy. You, you make it necessary in airports for international travel, and then you leave it up to jurisdictions, same in Australia. Then you leave it up to individual jurisdictions to make their own choices and give them no guidance as to how those choices are to be made. So I find it, a contradictory kind of situation where you have something that has the, at, at the very least, the makings of a more authoritarian approach, 
uh, being publicly, um, well, not mandated, but uh, publicly approved, but then you give permission to everyone to make up their own choices about what to do. I, I just find the whole thing very confusing. And, you know, I think it's going to take us years to work out what exactly was going on during this pandemic. And, uh, you know, if, you, if you're foolish enough to write a book about pandemic surveillance, you, you realize the moment that you've finished it that um, <laughs> things are changing already. And the, the rapidity of um, change with each added uh, dimension, each new innovation of uh, techno-solutionist, surveillance capitalism uh, kinds of innovations, I find bewilderingly hard to follow, frankly. And, you know, my talk this afternoon, it comes from a bewildered person. Um, as I suspect, we're all rather bewildered. But yeah, those would be the sorts of comments that I'd make on, on your question. But um, yeah, and even the people that I've read who have tried to use the term social contract, I, well, frankly, I haven't found a satisfactory one yet. <laughs> but I'm still looking, and I haven't given up hope. Thank you so much. Those are really interesting comments. Thank you. Stephanie, thank you, David. I think Greg has a question. Sorry, here we go. Uh, yes, David, I was wondering how far in the future is the possibility of microchipping children at birth as a way of commencing lifetime surveillance of the individual. Uh, I was in Japan a couple of years back, and when I came back, I thought what a wonderfully uh, compliant society it was. And a friend of mine who'd worked in a very senior role in Japan, said, yes, it's probably the most uh, surveilled country um, in in the Pacific because um, the police keep a file on families. So it's not just individuals within family, it's the family. So if one child in the family misbehaves, it go creates a black mark against the family. So, I mean, I come at it from, originally I was a retailer and so, barcodes were a very um, convenient way of keeping track of stuff and it, then there's been a growth in what barcodes can do but microchipping sort of takes it to a different level so I'm just wondering where do we go and where could this go in the future I'm not suggesting it should well yeah good question the um the Japanese case is, uh, is is an interesting one, um, but you have to remember the the Japanese context, where despite the uh, Meiji Restoration in the 1860s, despite um, the huge shift towards high technologies during the 20th century in Japan, there is an awful lot about Japanese culture that is still deeply embedded in an older authoritarianism and uh, a certain uh, citizen compliance with government uh, activity and, uh, for that matter, corporate um, uh, management as well. So. It's a very different place from Canada or Australia for a start, um, and and yes, there there are um, there, there is a, a a very interesting way in which the the Japanese were early adopters of certain digital technologies, but at the same time, you know, if if you're in Japan, you'll be aware of the ways in which. Um, the fountain pen and the fax machine and uh, actually ledgers, uh, hard copy ledgers are still used in all areas of government administration. So that kind of techno-orientalist understanding of Japan is, is, is sometimes a bit of a, a mistake, I think. And on the other hand, Japan has some of the finest uh, civil society and academic opponents of surveillance capitalism and uh, people who question surveillance in general. So there are, and, and perhaps it's that old um, imperial authoritarianism that still creeps through the contemporary Japanese culture that actually uh, sparks that opposition and, and very effective opposition from 
um, civil society and uh, and and uh, concerned academics. So yeah, um, how far will this go? Was your was your real question? Um, how far it goes will really depend on the answer to the questions that we were raising in the in the talk, um, which is the question of how far governments will be able to retrieve their capacity to um, rein in corporate activity, especially when that corporate activity is actually encouraged and enabled by the governments themselves. That is the conundrum that we really have in the 21st century with surveillance capitalism, that public-private partnerships, so-called, are so deeply entrenched in so many parts of the world. And this is the case, of course, as much in China as it is in the United States of America, um, that finding new ways of confronting uh, power, corporate and governmental, or both together, uh, is becoming an increasingly urgent and difficult question. Um, the countervailing um, powers are quite hard to identify, although there is a growing um, range of groups, as I say, from, from hacker groups through to those arguing for digital commons, to those who uh, utilize online media in order to... Um, as it were, try to erode from within those negative features of surveillance capitalism. The rise of those is, is uh, a, a very special aspect of, of what's happening. So I don't want to underestimate the capacity of uh, such groups, and uh, we have a number of them in Canada, and there are many around the world. But actually, how, how to operate against that notion that um, I think it was uh, Palito that I, uh, that I quoted to the effect that um, it is consumer desire that is underlying the consent given uh, or, or, or that represents the consent given by the consumer citizen or the citizen consumer to surveillance capitalism. Uh, but on the other hand, the, the attempt to um, shackle or to, um, or, or to rein in the activities of the major platforms is assisted each time uh, serious legal questions are raised of corporations like Facebook and Google uh, and Apple for that matter, uh, but especially the Facebook question I think is going to turn out to be a critical one for um, discovering how far it is possible to um, rein in the power of uh, platform companies. That is going to be the, the critical question for us, I think. So your question, how far will it go? Well, it could continue to all kinds of extremes like microchipping children. I mean, such things are not impossible, but they are, in my view, highly undesirable. They are not equivalent. Uh, they're not uh, conducive to the, to the common good for all kinds of reasons. And um, it's, it seems to me that I hope we don't have to wait for active proposals for microchipping children before we come to our senses and start to act more uh, responsibly in our online behavior. That's all that I can say. Okay, thanks, David. Good question, though. Thank you. I, I would love to get on to the, the broader theme of surveillance capitalism. Um, uh, and what levers and mechanisms are available to citizens in that context. But I, I do, I do want to raise a, a question that, that for me is, is glaring in the whole vaccine passport debate b b before we go there, if I could. And it's, it's the work that is being done by a very old technology, the, the technology of language, because it, it seems to me 
the, the language of passport is fundamentally deceptive as a metaphor in this context, because you don't need a passport to enter a restaurant. Uh, and in fact, you don't even need an identity card in any country that I'm aware of to enter a restaurant. So this, this language of passport seems to diffuse the, the intrusion of what is being proposed and to liken it to something that it is fundamentally unlike in order to make it seem normal. And so I'm, I, I would guess, David, I'm inviting you to reflect and, and, and think about the, the work being done by language in the surveillance debate uh, and, and whether you think there's anything vaguely or perhaps not quite so vaguely Orwellian about the metaphor of a passport in this context. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. And uh, I think that the the matter of um, uh, the, you know, new speak, double speak um, is significant here. And what we mean by uh, a passport and the, and the record that a passport has, not that passports have uh, an unsullied record uh, in their surveillance dimensions but yes you're right they they were also intended originally for some sense of common good and therefore were worth uh, were worth pursuing um so yeah i think the the question of language is a, is a really important one i already raised the question of language in my talk in relation to the use to the mili to the use of military metaphors in relation to the the battle with covid the struggle with covid the war against the uh against the contagion and and, and so on and I, I think that that metaphor too is one that um easily sips over into justificatory kinds of um, uh, aspects, um, dimensions. I mean, if, if you think you're in a war, then all sorts of things somehow are justified, or so the story goes, uh, because of the situation that you are in. Um, so yeah the the question of language i think is is a critical one as well and um it's it's very easy to um uh you know spray paint over something that is negative with a uh, a nice new color let's call it vaccine passports um and i think we see that i mean it also relates to the very first question about the um the role of journalism and so on the way that um the way that condition conditions that we're currently experiencing are described uh in the media and um you know the language is is critical there and um the discovery of appropriate language i think should be a uh priority in all this um it's not for nothing that uh, Orwell wrote about surveillance and uh, language in in the same novel. Um, so yeah, I, I agree that it's a that it's a really important, really important question that we should be should be raising, um, and and we need to find good language to raise the question as well. It's um, it's it's why I, I like. Uh, things like the Black Mirror portrayal of surveillance, because that, among other things, plays with language. And uh, I know it's not everyone can stomach Black Mirror, but um, but it really does raise some of the questions really poignantly and adroitly. Um, so you know, I I think well, in fact, from our research just to sidetrack for a second from our research the current research project that is just coming to an end um we put into the grant application uh a request for funds to make films and we made a series of three films they're not black mirror by any means you can't do black mirror on a low budget but they are films it's on it's a series called screening surveillance you can find them online uh, and they're three shorts, like 12 minutes long each. And those two raise questions about the experience of surveillance for those in everyday life who are 
experiencing surveillance, but it it deliberately uh, plays with the situation of being under surveillance. I mean, they're, they're serious. It's not humorous in any sense, but they are uh, looking at the ways in which ordinary people in everyday life encounter and are affected by surveillance and what happens as a result of that surveillance. So I think the question of representation is vital here and the language, the visual image, all these are questions of representation that I think are critical for uh, helping us to undermine that which has become dominant within the kind of surveillance capitalism world. Yeah, thank you. I, I couldn't agree more. It, I wonder whether there's a role for language to play in the what, what you were moving towards in, in your response to Greg's question, which were the, the, the levers and mechanisms that are available to us uh, to, to push back against some of the, the surveillance capitalism. And it, it seems to me that language is a fundamental consciousness raising um, uh, mechanism. And equally, the, whatever the opposite of consciousness raising, it's probably consciousness rigging or something like that. One, one, can, one can dampen down consciousness by an, by an astute use of language as well. Um, mm. the, the, the next question I wanted to ask was just picking up on a sentence that uh, in your talk that I, I wonder if you, you could elaborate on. Uh, you said something like pandemic surveillance affects the global south differently to the global north. And I, I'm just wondering how you see that difference. Oh, okay. Um, I just put the talking of global north and global south, I just had to go and put the light on because it's getting uh, dark in my part of the global north. And um, I realized that I was disappearing into gloom, um, which might be a benefit for you, but I wanted the light on. Um, so yeah, global north and global south. Um, well, in in the book, I find myself reflecting a fair bit on the experience of pandemic surveillance in different countries around the world, and I ended up being in touch with uh, folks in in India and Brazil and uh, in a couple of Af African countries, and um, I, I I I just was wanting to explore the ways in which. Surveillance is something that um, is normally thought of in terms of one country. You know, you think of your own country as the place where surveillance is being developed in a particular way. But the pandemic is a global pandemic. It is inescapable wherever you are in the world, given the consequences of uh, globalization. And so, um, I increasingly thought as I was writing that I should really have examples and illustrations from other countries. And from that, I, I became more and more aware of the differences of experience of, of surveillance. Again, as I was saying in the answer to, uh, uh, was it Greg's question about, uh, that included the comments about Japan, um, I, I realized that really we had to be a bit more uh, region specific, if not country specific in, in talking about these things. And the kinds of differences that uh, I have in mind relate, of course, to the very backgrounds of those countries. A number of them are colonial. So um, whether you're talking about Latin America or African countries or uh, many countries in Southeast Asia, you are talking colonialism. And that's why one of the most important debates within surveillance studies is how surveillance is uh, how surveillance operates in colonial situations and what impact that has on not only on those colonized, but also for those in the so-called mother country, where frequently in the history of surveillance, uh, experimental forms of surveillance have first been tried in the um, colonized countries before being brought home for use in the central. Very striking case, the United States imperial adventures in the Philippines and the ways in which what became the CIA uh, actually began it, as an experimental form in uh, the Philippines. So. But there are lots and lots of examples of that. So 
Colonization, really important for understanding surveillance, and therefore, I believe, decolonization uh, is also important for understanding a just uh, form of data handling, to put it at its broadest. Um, and so, vast differences. I mean, data paucity in many African countries means that we don't even know who is most at risk during the pandemic. And uh, World Health Organization, notwithstanding, and they've done a tremendous job in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, we still don't know so much that we could and should know. So here's an example of insufficient surveillance. Um, but also, if you go to uh, Brazil for another example, then in Brazil, you have uh, not only the colonial situation, but the ways that it's worked out uh, over the years with authoritarian governments, dictatorship for many years in the 20th century, the um, return to authoritarianism after uh, relief from authoritarianism for uh, quite a while, but the return to much more authoritarian government under J uh, Jair uh, Bolsonaro. Um, has meant huge um, uh, deprivation, well, increased deprivation, including in terms of um, access to care and um, vaccines and so on and so forth within the pandemic for those in the favelas, for those who are in the poverty-stricken uh, shanty towns, as they're sometimes called, um, in Brazil. Vast areas containing millions of people, uh, in contrast with the relative um, affluence of those in uh, some urban areas in Sao Paulo and uh, Rio in particular, but uh, throughout the country, it's, it's true. So disparities, that relate directly to the COVID situation and also directly to data gathering, data analysis, and data use in those contexts, which I'm thinking of in surveillance terms, because in the end, it's personal health data that is in question, that is being analyzed and used in these contexts. So huge disparities there, um, magnified um, by in, in the Brazilian case, by the authoritarianism of the uh, Bolsonaro government, um, makes for a very different situation from the kinds of uh, activities that took place and are taking place in the United States, different again from many European countries, um, where by and large, despite awful experiences of the COVID pandemic, like for example, in Italy, um, have have always had better treatment and better um, better experiences with the different forms of pandemic surveillance than those in sub-Saharan Africa and uh, several Latin, well, and Central American countries for that matter. So I'm sorry, you got me talking. I shouldn't give a lecture when I'm just asked a question, but there's the beginning of a, an answer anyway. That's wonderful, thank you. Now, I'm very glad you, you did expatiate on that because, um, yeah, I think it, as, as you have rightly identified, it is a crucial question um, mm -hmm. and one that, that goes right to the heart of this idea of data justice. We, we are running out of time. I wonder if I could just squeeze one final question in uh, before okay. we, we let you go uh, to the rest of your evening, David. It's, it's a question in terms, I guess, picking up on, on what Greg was asking again, of, of where, you see things going from here, possible futures from here. And I, I wonder to what extent you you think that the, the situation that we're failing, facing with surveillance capitalism at the moment is something like the, the beginnings of an incipient state, almost, you know, the metaphor of the Wild West is often used, but I, but I think it's apposite. You've got these, these warlords, these sheriffs enforcing their own laws in their own jurisdictions, these multinationals, Google, Apple, Amazon, and so forth, doing sort of what they like in, in their own um, turf. Um, and I wonder if 
a link can be made between those and what Robert Nozick talks about in Anarchy State and Utopia, these, these sort of almost organically emerging mutual protection societies that, that are the first budding of what will then become a minimal state. Um, and I, I wonder if we can see the, the situation at the moment as, as the very beginnings of a some more settled polity, some more settled um, situation evolving um, as, as you know, the Wild West eventually settled down. Um, and I, I guess what I want to ask in relation to that is, what do you think, do you think that is in any way a helpful way of looking at these things? And if so, what would it take for this Wild West situation to mature into something clo more closely resembling a, a, a democracy within um, the, the, the digital uh, realm? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, one short and simple question with a short and simple answer. Um, so I think one critical thing, and it's the reason that why I mentioned the uh, current debate with Facebook in the United States at the moment, is that it does seem to me that democratic polity appropriately understood includes great respect for the rule of law and that the rule of law should indeed be a central plank in the development of any social contract and that it should have the force of law, frankly, um, and that the, the rule of law is something that none of the major platforms is really willing to uh, accept. And that has become clear in, in, in many ways. Um, the Facebook case has to be the most prominent and uh, that's why it's the one that I, I'm watching most closely because I think it's critically important. Um, it's only a few years since the Cambridge Analytica Facebook debacle and um, that was such a critically important threat to democratic polity that it really had to become the cause celebre that it was for a time. But unfortunately, it did not um, eventuate in any kind of lasting solution, let alone actual concrete legal activity. And so while um, I said earlier that I believe that we should be thinking outside of the box of privacy and data protection, I do think that. I also think that those who stand for privacy law and data protection law ought to be encouraged and uh, ought to be um, assisted by civil society, um, all, all kinds of um, activist and hacktivist groups, I think, are important in trying to help privacy commissions, data protection um, offices to work for increasing and improving the legal limits on the ways in which platform companies in particular can operate. So I'm I'm all for that, and I strongly believe that that, as a matter of policy, should be a priority. Uh, at the same time, as I say, I, I, I do believe that uh, we are all implicated in this because right now we are online. We spend so much of our time online, and our online lives have become part of our ordinary, everyday lives. There was once an idea of being online and offline. There's no such thing. We are living our lives in part online. They're an aspect, a dimension of life as it is now lived. And therefore, we are all responsible to try to be online in appropriate ways. And that, I think, involves some pretty major work being done. Thankfully, there are some young people in our high schools and whatnot who are taking these issues seriously, and uh, there are people helping them 
in the educational process. And I think it has to start with the, the youngest folks, the way that I talk with my grandchildren about uh, social media and about uh, the platforms. I think this is critical too. We can't leave it to lawmakers and policymakers and government, critical though they are for uh, democratic polity. So I'm saying both and. This is something that affects all of us at every single imaginable level, and therefore at every single imaginable level, we should be working to try to uh, develop different practices. Because even our ordinary, everyday online practices of what you know cookies we accept or what kinds of platforms we allow ourselves to be part of, all these are decisions that it seems to me ought to be made with probably much uh, stronger and more careful criteria than we are used to making. So I think it is something for which we are all responsible, but it is also something that requires the rule of law to be exercised if the common good is to be sought in an age of surveillance capitalism and now pandemic surveillance. Well, with that um, very clear and I think very persuasive call to action, um, I'm afraid our time has uh, run uh, away with us. Um, David, it's been such a rich time. Thank you so much for uh, your reflections on these themes. Thank you so much for your generous engagement uh, with all the questions that were asked. I'm sure we all go away uh, sobered um, and with a great deal to think about and a great deal to do as well to put into practice some of the uh, principles and ideas that you've been sharing with us. So thank you so much uh, for your very generous time on, on a Thanksgiving season as well. Uh, thank you uh, for your generosity. Please join with me, everybody, in thanking uh, David Lyon.